Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Austin B Media Podcast. My name, as you might have surmised, is Austin Belzer. Today, I will be discussing the 2023 edition of the Toronto International Film Festival, otherwise known colloquially yeah, as TIFF, with my guest Thomas Stoneham Judge, who I believe we, I think we, our first meeting was AFI Fest 2020, trying to coordinate our schedules for my site, Austin B Media, and then you for your uh, site, which you co-founded for real. And that's R-L, not R-A-L. Yeah, um, little little play on words there. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's probably better than my play on words. But first of all, thank you so much for joining me. One of my, I, I think, first fans. I think you were one of my first patrons, too. Yeah. No, it's been great following you and your content. You're so active about publishing and being consistent and and yeah no and yeah and you have really great work on your website so i applaud any followers of austin and and yeah hopefully we we can continue growing our audiences yeah likewise but before we get into the hearty tiff discussion i want to give you the chance i mentioned before we started recording i was listening to uh, guts before we st- started recording uh it's my hype album right now actually um <laughs> But I'm trying something new. So is there anything outside of TIFF you want to give a quick shout out to? That could be Guts, whatever. This has been a week of sci-fi for me. So I had a chance to see the creator. So jealous. Yeah, I got to throw a shout out to that. I, I, It's actually going to be my first real buzzed episode for nice. the next set of videos that I'm going to be doing. Later on today, I'll be recording that and, and aiming to publish that on September 27th, at which point I will get back to a new season of Real Buzz over the next couple of months. And, and and then last night, I watched No One Will Save You, which... I did too. Yeah. Oh, man. There's a lot to talk about with that one. But I think just as a sci-fi horror experience, there it, it, was, it, it did its job. Yeah. <laughs> I had some problems with it, but... Those are major spoilers. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah just exactly. check out my, a, if you've another... seen it, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, no, that's a, that's another uh, conversation. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if you've seen it, go check out my letterbox review. It, it'll tell you my exact thoughts on it. Um, but mentioning Real Buzz and the creator. Um, so for those who don't know what Real Buzz is, it's a, you pair a, a alcoholic drink. I think, what was your secret invasion one? Oh, Secret Invasion, I did. Was that a, it was a bourbon for that one. I can't remember which, yeah. specifically which one. But yeah, no, I, I like to watch movies and drink whiskey. And so Real Buzz is my fusion of those two interests where I, I discuss a film and I pair it with a whiskey. So Secret Invasion spoilers, but did you freak out when they started drinking whiskey in the show? I, I was trying <laughs> to see what whiskey it was, but I couldn't catch the, catch the brand. It's probably um, Bullet. Probably. Which is fine. As long yeah, as it's not fine. Jim Beam, I will cancel anyone who <laughs> drinks Jim Beam. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Drink what you want. But I am not a fan of Jim Beam. <laughs> Me uh, um, But yeah, other than that, the creator, I'm going to be talking with Emmanuel Pagan Colon, who I just talked to about C- Cocaine Bear. Um, oh, fun. Um, which... Again, again, I know people are like, why are you talking about Cocaine Bear, a movie that released in February of 20 this year? I think it was this year. Yeah. February mm-hmm. this year. Yeah. yeah. They just released it on 4K Blu-ray for whatever reason. So I was like, I will take any excuse. Um, <laughs> There's no wrong time to talk about Cocaine Bear. <laughs> so, yeah, I will have him on the week of October 4th because I want to give people time to see it. Um, I think that's when we record is October 4th. But with that, I guess my quick shout out is to Guts. I've listened to it four or five times. And also, No One Will Save You. Pretty good. I think it's middle of the road for me. I think it's, I rated it a three or three out of five on Letterboxd. Because there's just some things which I'll, I can't spoil. But that just really didn't click with me. I'll just say there's like a 50s aesthetic. But you clearly it clearly takes place outside of the 50s. And it's, it just... I couldn't disconnect in that movie, which is <laughs> hilarious for people who've seen it. But but yeah, with that said, so let's get into our TIFF discussion. First and foremost, give us kind of a brief 
or or however long overview of the films <laughs> he saw or TV shows. I know they show TV shows there too. They did show TV shows and I'm not opposed to covering TV, but unfortunately I just didn't have the time at TIFF, which is wild because I was there for a while. Uh, but that's just how expansive that festival is. There's so much to do, so much to see, so many things that I want to accomplish while I'm in Toronto. And that's how I approach these festivals like Sundance in Toronto. I have to think about with my priorities, what things uh, can only be done in person. I have to prioritize those uh, opportunities. And so just maybe an overview of the festival. I had a really great time. I got to meet up with um, a, a lot of my online friends uh, and, and fellow press uh, people. Um, uh, I got to... Um, go to a couple uh, uh, socials, which was awesome. I hung out with the nice. team for uh, BlackBerry. Yeah, it was fun talking with Matt Johnson for a little bit and the producer, Matt Miller. And then just doing some hanging out and networking there as well. And then interviews, did a few interviews. My interview with Christos Nico is online right now. As you very generously put it, looks like it, it, a 60 minutes interview. Mm -hmm. I was very grateful to the publicist team and the, the, the people that put that interview together and had the whole production value thing going on. It was a good interview, a fun conversation, and kind of a really good opportunity for me to, to do something of that quality and to do it well. I was very happy about that. Yeah. Um, so... Those are the kind of things I got to do on the ground in Toronto. But in addition to that, I obviously saw a bunch of films. Most of what, a lot of what I saw was at home before the festival okay. and then a couple after the festival, because again, I try to prioritize doing things in person at Toronto. But I did see some really great movies in person. Films that, that come to the top of my head include like I got to see Rustin, sorry, Rustin. I don't know why mm -hmm. I see Rustin. I saw Rustin. That was a fun one. I saw Dumb Bunny which is now in theaters. Oh, Dumb and... Money. I thought you said Dumb Bunny. I was like, what? I don't, what I don't movie think, is that? I don't... <laughs> yeah, is that a kid's movie that I ever Sorry. heard of? <laughs> Dumb Money, I, I got to see. I was also on the red carpet for Dumb Money, which would have been really cool. But we all know the the current circumstances. I, I am appreciative of the opportunity. I talked with uh, Craig for a few moments, the director, Craig uh, Gillespie. So I saw Dumb Money. I saw Pain Hustlers, Nyad. Dick's the musical. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> we, we'll talk about that one. Um, okay. And, and I think the biggest one that I was most thankful I got to see at a theater was The Zone of Interest. And that's also one that we'll talk about. I do have a review for that one on my website right now. Just so if you can't wait the 10 minutes for me to bring it up, you can pop <laughs> over there for a moment and read that. But the zone of interest was, was one that I really had to fight tooth and nail to get a ticket for. And and I think it was worth it. So, Yeah. And worth noting, I think the UK picked that as their Oscars pick this year. Which makes a lot of sense. Unlike France. <laughs> yeah, that was a weird one. We're all a little, we're all kind of scratching our head at France right now. I'm like, oh, I you want to pick that one? Okay. To be fair... I have not seen Anatomy of a Fall yet. The press screening at TIFF was the day before I was able to get to town. So I couldn't go to that. And there was only one screening that I possibly could have made it to. But there was also a conflict with that. So I'll be seeing Anatomy of a Fall during the Vancouver Film Festival. I do have a ticket for that. And so I'll be seeing it there. And then I can maybe have a better a better perspective on, <laughs> on what that movie is and where, where it might belong in the award season. But it is interesting how there's this tendency to pair Anatomy of a Fall and the Zone of Interest. For any press that uh, happened to be keeping up with TIFF, they did this thing on the very first day where they were press, they screened Anatomy of a Fall first, and then right after had a screening for the Zone of Interest, <clears throat> which everyone wants to, to do. And so putting those back to back with a very small window was a very curious uh, decision. But this also has a Anatomy of a Fall double feature scheduled uh, for the public. And it's just interesting that those two movies get paired together, at least in the spheres that I'm in, together a lot. <laughs> they're two very different movies from what I understand. I think so too. But, but they're both very much in the awards conversation as they, I imagine, should be. I know Zone of Interest should be. And, and yeah, they're super high demand films. And so let's just put them back to back. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I... 
And it's weird. I don't think I've been to a, I say been, all my stuff has been virtual, but although I did want to go to South by Southwest, what was it, mm. last year, but mm-hmm. I'll, but a little behind the scenes, they make you pay for that ticket and that ain't cheap. Oh, do they? Yeah. Uh, just Oof. a little behind the scenes for our listeners slash watchers. I got a discount mm. and the discount was like negligible. It was a few hundred dollars, but it was still going to be $800 for the ticket. That's just wild. The- Telluride does a similar thing last I checked, where if you get accepted, you have to buy the, the pass. And a, just a, a shout out to all the festivals that don't make us do that. I think that it's important to recognize what we do at this, these festivals is work. Uh, yeah. This is we're promoting the festival, we're promoting the the selections, and we're not just going and watching movies and and then not taking anything away from that. Yeah. We are putting in a lot of effort um uh, to be there, to uh, write on these films, to have coverage at the festival, and honestly, this takes up uh, for TIFF for sure. It takes up like a month of my time to do right. Um, And on top of that, we do still have the expenses of getting to there, right? So unless you're already local, there is already a cost involved with with participating, whether that be accommodations, flights, transportation, all of that stuff. So it's already not a cheap endeavor. And then to make press pay for passes, that is that's not something I'm a big fan of. But I go on that whole rant just just to say, firstly, that we put in a lot of work with what we do and don't think that us talking about watching four movies a day is just fun. That's yeah. that itself is exhausting, but we also are mm-hmm. working with that. But secondly, supporting your favorite press people is important and hit that Patreon. <laughs> yeah, that those funds go a long way to helping us do what we do and be in the places that we need to. And so that's anyway. there's my rant. <laughs> yeah and to echo your sentiment i think tribeca which is my most extensive coverage and this mm-hmm. was all from home mind you i think it took two months from from like credentialing before i was even credentialed they were like hey here's a bunch of tribeca in, uh, emails in your inbox so i probably sent 300 emails Woo-hoo. um <laughs> uh, something like that. I'll have to go back and look one day yeah. and then scheduling interviews, uh, recording and editing those interviews mm-hmm. and making little cute social media clips for those interviews and then writing those reviews. It easily <laughs> took that took a month, almost two months of my time. Yeah. So, yeah. so the takeaway here, thank you festivals for recognizing the work that we do and comp- and comping our press passes. And thank you supporters for helping fill in some gaps in the other expenses that are involved with uh, festival coverage. Yeah, you can go to either of our patrons to support what we do, which I'll mention at the end of the show. Both, I guess both of ours, because we both have so patrons. I do not have a Patreon yet. You can actually support me directly on the website. And okay. I'll make sure to send the link so that you can you can publish that if you if you have a description area. Oh yeah, I do. But yeah, so getting back to TIFF, what was the overall theme of the festival for you? I know with Tribeca there was like a New York. We're only talking about New York, yeah, for whatever reason. But did the strikes impact yeah. that yeah, in any way, or is that in, the theme? Let's get into it. Uh, so. If you haven't attended TIFF before, the obviously every festival has its focus when it's programming. TIFF is really good at programming international film, so Asian cinema. It's really good at programming Canadian cinema. And then typical years, it's really good at programming fall blockbusters, I guess you could say. Like they premiered uh, Glass Onion last year, <laughs> Woman King, Bros, right? So they also have a pulse on the mainstream, the mainstream film world as well and then there's a lot of other like indie films thrown in there as well so they know how to pick out gems they know how to program really well but with this year there's this little thing going on that's the strike and that's certainly i think the effects of that was very was at least apparent to me as a press person i don't know how apparent it was to casual tiff goers um maybe regular tiff goers might have noticed the the absence of movies. I expected Dune 2 to be there. I expected Killers of the Flower Moon to be there. This might have even been a good platform for Wonka, Color Purple. Those kind of movies weren't really programmed. I think the biggest ones were Dumb Money, 
um, which is now in theaters, not the most important one to see there because it, it's now in theaters already. And, <laughs> and the next goal wins, which I think is solidifying the the nonchalantness. What's the word to use on how ap- apathy, uh, the uh, an apathetic Taika Waititi film, it just doesn't doesn't accomplish much. So anyway, uh, but for what for the programming that the that this festival does have, it's it was really top notch programming still, and I really appreciated that it seemed like there was an effort to pivot and accommodate the or at least work around what's going on with the strike in the, in the most efficient and effective way. And I think they did that. I think that they did have some good heavy hitters. I think that they had some nice gems, some good under the radar finds. And I'm excited for those to start working their way into the world. Yeah, here's hoping. And I don't know why, but I, I was thinking this might have been a good place for Iron Claw too. Yeah, it could have been. Uh, but I would love to learn more about how a festival like TIFF programs, especially with the fact that TIFF is a part of the trifecta of film festivals around this September, or sorry, August, September time. It Can runs I give con- you some insight? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's go. Because I, a little behind the scenes, I guess that's, that's what we could subtitle this, but <laughs> but I met with the Tribeca programmers. Oh, like They had a little, little pro- programmer Zoom where they talked to all the programmers. Mm-hmm. And basically how they have it set up, I don't know if basically one each section has a programmer. Mm-hmm. So if there's an international film, they have the international programmer or mm-hmm. the gala programmer, whose main job really is to, and for those who don't know, gala is basically, hey, these movies are coming out soon. So it's not like it's mm-hmm. a premiere, but it'll be out soon. So you can see it here first. So gala is mainly just, tasked with okay what are the big films we can promote that are coming mm-hmm. that might even have a new york elemental what was this mm-hmm. year oh um, yeah that's right it was but didn't premiere it premiered at can but yeah it, it was basically just each section had a, pro, a specific programmer to it mm-hmm. and with yeah and this is go ahead sorry this is a good thing to point out because i did so i did have the opportunity to talk with the tiff midnight madness programmer peter uh, Kuplowski. Um, and it was fun getting his take on how he programs the Midnight Madness because Midnight Madness is always, um, at least from what I'm told, a, a fun time. Uh, I I have not had the bandwidth to do a Midnight Madness screening yet. <laughs> um, it, it's a lot to, to go a whole day and then be up at midnight. Um, but I hear great things about it. And honestly, seeing the films that premiered last year at Midnight Madness then go into the world and become mainstream films like Sizu was one of them so it's cool to to talk with him and and get his perspective on that but the interesting thing about TIFF is that it happens concurrently with with Telluride and Venice and all three of them seem to clamor for big premieres and what is the decision making process in programming the premiere of Woman of the Hour at TIFF but and also with Venice getting Saltburn and poor things, right? So yeah, it'd be interesting just to figure out more about what kind of negotiating has to happen to figure out which movies go to what festivals. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point because you bring it up Venice and Telluride. Mm-hmm. It, it those were two festivals that other than I mean, I don't know about you, but I heard nothing about Telluride. Mm-hmm. I just heard uh, Venice and Tiff. Yeah, tell you right, I I wasn't very in tune with it's a it's almost like a I would it's not a private festival, but it feels that way. It happens in yeah. like this small town, Colorado. I don't think that they have the their program is super simple. It's just these are the movies, these are the times they play. And I think yeah. that they announce their films like the day before the festival or something. So really you're just going and being it and being served up what they uh, come up with. And I think that there's probably a really cool experience involved with that. Um, if you're affluent enough <laughs> to to afford that that experience. But but yeah, so I guess for those reasons, I don't really pay as much attention to tell you ride. If I'm not mistaken, that's where the bike riders probably premiered. And yeah, so that I was so. their, that was their big get for this year. But then, of course, they played a bunch of things that also played TIFF and Venice. But Venice, I think, is the one that that has 
at least this year, it definitely had the, the biggest premieres. Yeah, it definitely had the splashiest things on social media, especially mm-hmm. after four things. Got, mm-hmm. uh, I think they were doing, was it reviews that they were doing? I can't remember. But I, but yeah, it, it was interesting this year because it <laughs> felt like Telluride faded into the background. But yeah, I, I would be interested next year for the festivals to see because Tribeca doesn't usually do those programs. Mm-hmm. It's the first mm-hmm. year that I've been invited to one, at least in the three years I'd been covering it. So if more festivals want to do that, like AFI Fest, if you're listening, also <laughs> please please buy me a plane ticket because I cannot afford the trip to LA otherwise. But I would love to see something like AFI Fest, especially since they did they integrated AFI docs into mm-hmm. their programming. Uh, or even just like something next year, like Sundance would be nice mm-hmm. uh, to have a more uh, sit down moment where press can talk to the programmers and be like, hey, why did you program this here? Like you said, mm-hmm. like why program it here as the premiere rather than Venice or Telluride? Yeah, and and I guess I just wonder, because obviously each programmer is responsible for their own festivals and in in going into the fall season, because of that cluster of festivals that happen at the same time, and they're all high profile, it just makes me wonder, even with, honestly, I'd like to talk with the filmmakers who have to make these decisions, like they're getting, yeah, yeah. so there's a lot, but I think that it's important that to know that every festival has its own vibe, right, what I was explaining with Tiff. Each festival has its own vibe and they curate the program to that established vibe, which is great, right? Because Sundance, Sundance isn't going to have the blockbuster features, but it's going to have movies that become mainstream staples, things like Past Lives. Y'all, I cannot stop talking about Past Lives. That movie. Still haven't seen it. Oh, bro, do that. Get off of this it podcast. It just came available then... for rent. I'm yes. going to, as soon as I can. Past Lives is amazing. And so it was Sundance is the place that premieres the indie films, the directorial debuts, the sophomore films. And it's so cool that they have such a massive pool of new talent to really curate a special program. And every single year they do it. Every year they have stellar stuff. There is, I'm trying to think since the pandemic, when I started attending Sundance, every year a Sundance film has been in my top five of the year. Yeah, it was still. Sundance? Uh, yes, it was. Yep. But yeah, that's my number one of the year. So, mm-hmm. and I didn't even yep. go to Sundance. That was something <laughs> I saw on a random like Saturday mm-hmm. on Apple TV Plus. And honestly, I challenge you to go back and look at where some of your favorite films uh, premiered at, because you might be surprised how many films you've seen and love uh, premiered at Sundance. I think about a Donnie Darko it was yeah. a Sundance premiere, and I spent years like appreciating Donnie Darko, but it wasn't until I started doing the film festival thing that I went back and looked and I was like, oh, well, that's a fun fact. Sundance discovered Donnie Darko. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) I'm trying to see. I'll put it in the notes, but I'll let people know what the results of those are, or maybe Mm -hmm. even make it a Patreon post. Yeah. Because that'd be interesting. Because I know, oh, there was like a Russian. No, that (laughs) was like in my top, 15 i think of that year mm-hmm. but it was a netflix film i forget what it's called uh, i'll probably it, but it was like set in a tv station and, and the guy was holding people in hostage at the tv station i'll let you know what i think what it was but that was yeah. really good yeah but yeah I'll, I'll be very interested to see the results of that and speaking of surprises what selections this year surprised you the most in either how good they were or how utterly terrible they were (laughs) so i am happy to say that there weren't any films that i saw that were utterly terrible there are some that weren't right there there were some that i wish could have been better or, or maybe could have appealed more to my sensibilities in film i think like a movie like quiz lady for example um okay uh, Sandra O, oh, Aquafina. That's a pairing that is intriguing, and it's and it's also interesting that they play reverse of what we typecast them as. Sandra O oh is usually the more serious actor, and Aquafina is more of the goofy one. But in this movie, Aquafina is the more mature one, and and uh, Sandra O oh is not. And so that was an interesting dynamic. But I watched it, and as I'm watching it, I'm thinking this was played correctly. This belongs on Hulu. <laughs> this is exactly where this movie belongs. This belongs on TV, 
on the couch while you're like, I don't know, maybe I writing don't know, up a like, review, writing a review, <laughs> which I, I hate to say, but it's that kind of like lowbrow comedy and just something that that is so low involvement. Um, yeah. Hulu is where it belongs. So it ha- it does have a few, a couple really funny scenes that, that I feel like they just like it, they made and then wrote the movie around because those this, when it gets really funny, it is exceptionally funny, just like SNL skit funny. Modern but, SNL um, or old SNL? I'm not familiar with old SNL, but just you could see it as a sketch or something like okay. that. Okay. And this is what I'm getting at. So anyway, Quiz Lady was one that it's, I, I point that out because it's probably the, the least favorite of what I saw, but there's an audience for it and they own it. Yeah, I'll see it. All you had to um, say was Sandra Oh. I know, exactly. That's why I saw it, Sandra. It was amazing. <laughs> so when you go into these festivals, you have there are movies that you have high expectations for. Movies like Fingernails was a big one that I had high expectations for. daddy is one that I had high expectations for. Even like Pain Hustlers, I had high expectations for. But Really? I, I did. I When I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, I, I think I won't ask for this for review. See, and that's where you messed up. Uh, you don't watch the trailer. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Netflix description is so bare bones. I didn't even know what it was about. Well, see, and that's that's how I prefer going into movies. I don't. I I read the descriptions, of course, when trying to select movies, but I don't watch the trailers. I don't read the reviews. I want to go in as blind as possible, which it, it tends to work in my favor. I think it works. It works for me more than it doesn't. And so I've held on to that that approach. But for the most part, movies that I had high expectations for tend, tended to have met those expectations. And so I don't think I have any big disappointments. I do have some surprises, though. So one of the surprises that that really impressed me, I had the opportunity to screen before the festival. And if I hadn't gotten the screener, it just would not have been on my radar. But it's the film The Teacher's Lounge. Um, okay. It's. Oh, what country of origin is it? Was it Belgium? I can't remember. But it's a very, it's not a very involved kind of film from the premise, but it does a lot when it comes to building tension and suspense. German film. Yeah. Building tension and suspense in a very normal environment over seemingly, relatively speaking, low level offenses just the amount of missed relationships and interactions in the movie it it touches on so many interesting themes in such an organic way and you just watch this movie thinking about all the ways that it should have gone and the ways that it does go just give you so much stress because it's like that's not the correct procedure that's not the right way to do it and you're stressed about what's going to happen because all of these micro these micro actions are are building this tension. Okay, now this so. sounds like a movie I need to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Teacher's Lounge. It's. It, I think it was probably criminally overlooked at the festival, but that's why I'm so happy I got a screener for it beforehand. Because even for me, I would I would not have considered this movie at all at the festival. And not. I don't think that's an indictment on the appearance of it. It's just. That there's there there aren't any credits to it that really stand out to me. So it would have taken some really strong buzz for me to be like, oh, maybe I should look it up. Yeah. So just for those who haven't maybe gone to a festival, I do want to say there's like a thing where a lot of people like us who mm-hmm. are like maybe like getting to the Sing Sings or Dix the mm-hmm. Musical, the big ones that you're like, oh, I know this is gonna either get clicks or it's mm-hmm. gonna be something I need to see. So movies like this kind of just, if there's not an obvious hook, like you say, there it's just, oh, I can see that like when it comes out. Yeah, I there, there are times I don't even like, it's not even on my radar. It's not even yeah. there for me to say, I'll see it another time. It just, I just gloss over it. And you have to, these uh, festivals have so many movies. You're never going to get to all of them. And so really as a press person, you're trying to prioritize what to do. And obviously we have an audience to appeal to. We have, we, we, our success is based on clicks. And so we do go for those big films, but it's also fun to get these under the radar gems. You just don't know them yeah, <laughs> until you know them. Yeah. Um, I, even with like a month, like sc- advanced screeners, I only saw about 34 movies at Tribeca mm-hmm. and there was a hundred plus. Yeah. 
And there's oh. no way. There's no way. Even if you had the, if you had no, no writing to do, if you had all, all you yeah. could do is just watch movies for two weeks, you're still not going to get through the whole program, um, or even all of what you want to see. I just, you just, you just can't. Um, I know people at, at at TIFF who are doing five movies a day for seven days. That that is, if you're not a part of what we do, you might think complaining about watching movies all day is trivial but no it is energy it is effort like yeah. we're trying to pay attention to these things and some of them are low involvement but some are also really involved and take a lot of mental energy to like process and think about and analyze there's a lot to it i know there's some people out there that don't believe my mom doesn't believe me <laughs> but... yeah it's like <laughs> give an illustration it's somebody will ask me what I'm thinking about a movie after, after I see it, and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I've already written the review in my head mm -hmm. it, because I'm writing the review as I'm watching it because I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, that was a pro, that's a con. Mm -hmm. Make this note as soon as the credits roll. Mm. Oh yeah, and if you go to press screens, you'll see people all the time with their little notepads. I do it. They do notepads, taking notes throughout the movie. Yeah, <laughs> I used to do that, but then I would look at it after, and I couldn't understand my own handwriting. <laughs> Hieroglyphics. It is hard to write in the dark. <laughs> I need or to write I, while watching the screen. <laughs> I need every theater to have those Alamo Draft House lights. Oh yeah, I can the just little lamp like, light. Yeah, where I can just put it underneath the seat or something mm -hmm. like, or in front of me, and okay, make a quick note of that. Or at least have a notepad set up for me to where I just mm -hmm. know where it is. Mm -hmm. But anyways, yeah, that's just <laughs> behind the scenes. So we talked about Quiz Lady. We talked about Teacher's Lounge. Um, do you want to talk about Dix? What else? What other selections do you want to talk about? I'll mention Dix really quick. Dix is one of those movies where the credits are appealing for a, a couple of them. Obviously, A24 catches my mm -hmm. attention. It's a musical. I also happen to like musicals, so that's interesting. Megan Thee Stallion, I'm a fan. Savage, mm -hmm. ah, right? <laughs> I, I'm all about it. And so it's just an interesting combination of components to this film. And then you get into it, and I'm telling you, you got, I don't think audiences are ready for the level of absurdity that this movie hits. The TIFF audience loved it. I, I'm, I, so I saw it at a press screening, which was okay. a little more subdued because it was like, nine in the morning we're all still yeah. like sipping on coffee so it wasn't quite as like engaging or involved as as i would have wanted but i people that went to the midnight madness screening just raved about the experience this is a movie that is worth engaging with look if you're going to dicks be ready to applaud be ready to cheer be ready to cringe <laughs> just be ready for anything because I can only imagine this movie was just written in this days of, I don't know, hallucination. It just, the, how it progresses is absurdity. It just isn't logical, but it's so entertaining if you're prepared for what, for just taking in anything. So yeah, I think some people complain that Megan the Stallion's number in the movie is a bit out of place. And I guess you could say that, but embrace it there's nothing about this movie that makes sense <laughs> so in a movie called dicks the musical I, I feel like you should be going in to the movie being like you know what i'm just gonna throw everything out the window that i have conceptions for and I'm just, just... <laughs> soak it in i'm just so concerned that people will be like oh a musical from a24 this must be highbrow a24 no. does put out pretty, pretty some sophisticated content, but it's interesting how they've diversified their selections. I was on a A24 retrospective podcast from ContraZoom and the people over there, and I and we were talking about what makes an A24 film. And I think that there was a time when that was a more straightforward answer. It's genre bending, sci-fi, a hard hitting drama, things like that. There was a, it was a very niche studio that did have kind of a subset genre that it focused on. That is not the case anymore. The no. A24 spans so many different genres and so many different kinds of movies. And so it, it's harder to answer that question now. But the answer that I gave then, I think it was a couple of years ago, the answer that I gave then that is still, I think, pretty relevant is that what, what makes an A24 film an A24 film is that it's memorable. Whether it's you like it or not, whether it's good or not, it's a movie that's going to stick with you and that you're going to think about and remember. And I think that's still true, especially this year. A24 is cranking out just incredible films, again, across the span of all genres. And 
the ones that I have seen are still very memorable. And some of them I cannot stop talking about. Uh, yeah, I would add an addendum onto that mm -hmm. is that they always look a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. They're very pretty looking. Very pretty. Like even the whale, which was like really dark, both cinemat in cinematography, mm -hmm. but also in tone, it was also like, oh, this is how an A24 movie is supposed to look. You know? mm. So it was a different aspect ratio for sure. Yeah, okay. So the one time they actually got outside four by three. But um, yeah, even the Iron Claw looks pretty beautiful in its own mm -hmm. way. Yeah, it's interesting because they have a, a level of professionality to their movies that isn't polished, right? Yeah. It's quality, but it's not glossy. And, and I don't know how better to explain that when you go to a, your local Regal or AMC and you watch the blockbuster, I, that's what I call glossy, right? Like, yeah. it's very like high resolution, IMAX AK. cameras. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a polished film, yeah. uh, I guess, it, is the only way I can explain it. But A24 films do have a grit to them uh, yeah. a lot of times in, in one way or another. So anyway, I'm because I, I think that Dix was supposed to come out next week, but I yeah. think they they pushed it to after the Taylor Swift Everyone's movie. Everyone's afraid of Taylor. As they should be. As they should be. <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> really, I guess, as, as long as the Swifties aren't insufferable about it, I'm good. <laughs> oh, we uh, will be. Just wait. <laughs> <We will. laughs> okay, Dix is October 6th. That's two weeks from now. Let me double check. Like I saw that's what a 24 films.com says oh i wonder if that's limited release that might be limited honestly you know what if dicks the musical wanted to have a successful limited release they would only show midnight screenings <laughs> i mean or out or just exclusively at alamo draft house yeah uh exactly put that in places where the proper audience is going to be in a place to accept whatever it is um and that ain't my area mm. Yeah, so according to uh, my contacts, it was moved to the 20th. Okay, so that's probably so, the wide. Yeah. Anyway, fix the musical. I yeah. am very interested in seeing when, seeing what people, how people react to that. Yeah, based on my market, it'll probably be like another Fast Lives where I have to wait to rent it because are I swear. Gonna, it, are, it, are they going to release it in Missouri? <laughs> in Springfield. Oh, okay. That makes sense. But that's two hours away from me. I'm not driving two hours. <laughs> I ain't doing that. That's even funny. for Bo is Afraid, I, or, or Nope didn't even play here. Um, Yikes. Yeah. I was like, so I just really have to wait till, till it comes to rental. That's fair. Or Spirit Awards, because generally A24 just rocks the Spirit Awards. Oh, yeah, they um, do. For sure. Sorry, I'm here. The yes, there is one I didn't get to. And there's a story, a cautionary tale, but also just a little sad on my part. There is a film that I had a ticket for to see on the day that I got into Toronto. Mm -hmm. But that day was yeah, it was I took a red eye in that day. I went straight to the festival. I did get to see Guillermo del Toro talk and that was fun. I had to meet up with some people. And by the time that screening came at what, 8 30, 9 o'clock that night, I was just like, that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm going yeah. to fall asleep on that movie. I don't know anything about it yet. Um, anything after yeah. seven. It's it was a long day. And again, I, I, I took a red eye that day. So I didn't really sleep all that much. Yeah. So I, I skipped the screening that night and was really bummed about that. But I still had a lot of week. And so I rescheduled myself to see the press screening on Wednesday. But of course, because my schedule shifted multiple times throughout the week. I had to see something else during that time. So I then had to cancel that again. And so then I moved it to another day and then didn't couldn't go to that. So I think there are three different times that I was supposed to see this movie and didn't. And then it won the audience award. And that movie is American fiction. And I am so oh. mad. I am so mad. It's not even a film that was like, oh, I that wasn't on my radar. I missed it because I just didn't know. No, I knew. And people were talking about it. And there were just some difficult decisions that I had to make. In fact, the very last time, the very last opportunity that I had to see it, I had to choose between that one and the my favorite film of the festival, actually, Hitman. And I'm oh, like, okay. I, I that that is an impossible situation to be put in 
where do you see this film that everyone's been raving about that American fiction it, it, it and obviously I didn't know then but there was a lot of buzz about it possibly winning the audience award or do you see Hitman from Richard Linklater and it doesn't have distribution so you don't know when you're going to be able to see it and it also has a lot of buzz about winning the audience award so I went with Hitman and it, it's not a decision that I regret Hitman I think is my favorite film of the festival so I'm glad that I saw it Netflix just wrote a pretty check for that movie <laughs> which I'm a little not not the happiest about. I wish I got into more neon, um, neon A24, something more along those lines. Not a not a Netflix streaming. It'll service. get buried. It, it and and it shouldn't. It's so good, especially but, with the killer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. I think those are going to be those are two very different films. But I do think that Hitman is very special with the kind of film that it is, and I think that people will gravitate to that. But yeah, American fiction, I am so mad that I had so many chances to see it and it just couldn't work out. But the reason that this is a cautionary tale is because when it comes to planning these festivals, you have to be flexible and yeah. you have to you have to be very cognizant of your expectations, very cognizant of your bandwidth. But also just realizing you're not going to get to everything. And I know last year, my big disappointment that I missed was how to blow up a pipeline. And I beat myself up for months for not being able to get to that at TIFF. <laughs> and here's the thing, right? I'm, I was favorable on the film. Is it my favorite of the year? Is it going to go any top list for me? No, but I do think that would have been a good film to watch at a festival instead of watching at home on streaming. So Yeah, it, it didn't hit on Hulu. It did mm. not hit on Hulu. Or <laughs> no, I think I rented it. But I, I saw that and Blackberry, I think, back to back. Oh fun. Oh that's, yeah. that's quite that's an interesting double feature. Or, or or something like that. Either back to back or like the day after. Because mm -hmm. I had seen I rented a bunch of movies like Blackberry, Creed Three, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was like a bunch of movies <laughs> where I was like, Okay, I've got some Microsoft rewards. Here's fifteen dollars. Oh, in mm -hmm. free movies that I don't have to pay <laughs> anything for. There you go. Um, I rented like three or four movies. But yeah, I'll just say in that situation, if I'm like given the chance of, do I pick the lesser known movie or the one I think I know is going to win, mm -hmm. I go with the underdog in that situation. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm like, I, if uh, it's, I'm going to have a second chance. And I think American Fiction had already been picked up by Netflix at that point, right? I don't, it's an MGM film, but it has a release date. And I think that ultimately became the deciding factor is, okay, American Fiction, I think it comes out in November. It has a release date. It will be in theaters. Uh, Hitman at that point was not picked up yet. And so there's, we knew someone was going to pick it up. There was just too much buzz Glenn about Powell. it. Yeah, exactly. And he, honestly, if, the, if there is a little more preparation, I would have put him in the Oscar race. And maybe he should. And that's one of the concerns that I have with the movie is that Netflix picked it up. They're not going to rush it to award season. I don't think it's going to come out this year. It might be a spring release. And yeah, March. Might be, yeah, March, April, maybe even May. I don't know. But I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. I think Netflix is going to bank that one and hold on to it for a little bit. And so I'm happy that's the one that I chose to see because it is really good. And, I, and now I get to spend indefinitely raving about a film that nobody can see. <laughs> I, I run into that situation too because like our son I don't think got picked up mm, uh, at Tribeca that. and I'm just like I recommended it to the director of something you said last night in our mm -hmm. director interview plug and but I'm like I don't know if anyone bought it mm -hmm. I hadn't I haven't heard anything since Tribeca which um, is tough and but, like a movie mm -hmm. I saw at Slam Dance, Waiting for the Light to Change just mm -hmm. got distribution like a month ago yeah, so it's that's, I think that's one of the challenging things about the festival is, and I've talked with a bunch of friends about this. Is we go to these festivals, we see these movies, and then we go to our friends and scream, "This movie is so good!" And of course, our friends reasonably respond, "Oh, cool, where do I watch it?" And I'm just like, "You can't! <laughs> it comes out in 2024, so it's a question mark. We don't know. <laughs> that's the fun of it. Isn't this fun?" <laughs> I, I will say the good thing about Tribeca 2023 is there was a lot that came out that same week. Take Care of Maya dropped on Netflix. Mm -hmm. The uh, John Daly or something like that. John something, a comedy special on HBO Max. Or, sorry, mm -hmm. Max. 
please. The internet wants me to call Twitter X, and that's just not happening. No, so. I'm just going to call it Twitter. <laughs> yeah, um, as we should. <laughs> but yeah, any other... I think, well, so I, really quick on, on Hitman, I think what, what we're going to see, if Netflix wants a winning strategy for this movie, picking up the kind of steam that it deserves, I could see Hitman going to Sundance. Um, Sundance is a good Ooh, yeah this that would is be a good great. a good opportunity to put in Sundance because Sundance is like a fast track to award season if you release at Sundance you have a pass on <laughs> on getting through the year and into award season so I, I think that there have been quite a number of films that have been able to go from Sundance to award season and I think before everything everywhere that was just a very hard thing to do otherwise so I could see Netflix sending it to Sundance it having a, a lot of exposure there and then a like mid-spring early summer release like past lives uh, yeah. and I think that would be a winning strategy for getting Glenn Powell at least a nomination so. yeah just Netflix look at me Netflix if you're watching <laughs> I, I don't think you are <laughs> But listen to me. <laughs> listen, don't drop it when a, a, like 30 other movies are releasing that same week. Don't do drop it. Drop it when nothing is coming out. That way what? you can give people like a, a solid week to digest it. <laughs> do this with the killer, too. I don't care that it's November and it's going to be a packed November. <laughs> Just drop these big movies in a void where you uh -huh. have nothing. Yeah. Um, like Fair Play, I think, uh, is getting dropped into a void where there's not a lot coming out this October. Mm -hmm. um, and Reptile, too. They moved both of those up. Um, oh, funny story about Reptile. I was I didn't see Reptile at TIFF. I did sit in the theater before it started. I I had I was going to the press screening and it was my plan the whole time to go to the press screening of Reptile. And I got to the theater and I sat down in my seat. I was like 20 minutes early and I was like, I don't think I want to see this movie. And then I went to see Dicks. And that was like the best decision that I made the whole festival because I just didn't think that Reptile was going to be the mood that I was in at, at that morning. And so I just made this like game time decision. And I I think that was a decision that worked. What, you didn't want to see another movie with Alicia Silverstone in it? Uh, it's not, I think festival. the cast looked great. I just thought, man, there's nothing about this movie that really appeals to me. I'm going for the cast, but it's a longer movie than I feel like dealing with right now. And Dix just sounds like a lot of fun. And yeah. I think that I could use some fun right now. So this is, again, uh, is along the lines of being aware of your bandwidth and your yeah. expectations at a festival. Like making those game time decisions can be crucial to having a good festival. Yeah, and I don't say that as like a derogatory thing against Alicia Silverstone. I'm just like, this is weird that you're <laughs> in this movie with Benicio Del Toro, but I guess Justin Timberlake's in it too, so yep. it's weird. But <laughs> I know you have a hard out. That Absolutely. happened like can... five, five minutes ago, <laughs> six minutes ago, actually. Really quick, any tips for those who want to go next year to TIFF? This is a really great question. Yes, I do have tips. In fact, I have tips that I don't know if I want to share because they work so well for me. <laughs> but you know what, Austin, just because we, we go way back, I'm going to give insider okay. information here and, and I'm going to give exclusives for your audience. Here's the thing. Uh, like I said before, managing expectations is important. And when you're going to these festivals, getting tickets can be ridiculously tough. It's just the demand is so high. And honestly, these festivals really prioritize their high paying donors and their high paying memberships and everything. And so they typically have first crack at these tickets. And so for some of these high involvement or uh, high demand movies, it's very hard to get tickets, especially to the premieres. So tips when it comes to that is to just keep trying. And if Ticketmaster is managing the tickets, don't use it. Just call in your tickets. Call the, the, they can we they can still accommodate purchasing tickets over the phone. Call in your tickets. Do not deal with the ticketing system for first run trying to get premiere tickets. It's just it's a nightmare every year. And I also have a personal vendetta against Ticketmaster. <laughs> we all know you're a Swifty. You can say yes, I am. But Ticketmaster screwed me over a few too many times, and I and so that's a personal thing that I have. But even just in general, just getting tickets through a Ticketmaster system is just it's not fair. It's awesome. not fun. It's not even there's any redeeming qualities to it. It's just it's so dysfunctional 
don't do it. Call your tickets in. As soon as the phone line opens, have the, the number ready, dial it in, and talk with the receptionist and let them get the tickets for you. That is that is the biggest thing that I've learned uh, at festivals like this. Yeah, and if you want an alternative system, Tiff, I, I don't think you're listening, but but for whoever manages the ticket system, just do Eventive. That seems to be working pretty well for other festivals. I know that's majorly for virtual festivals, Mm -hmm. but I feel like there's a way you could do that for physical festivals too. I also wonder if uh, just an in-house ticketing system. Look, Sundance slays, okay? Oh, Sundance. (laughs) We all bow to Sundance (laughs) and how Sundance just executed everything so well. I never have complaints about how Sundance does things. They just, they are just on point with their systems. Yeah. And their 2024 website just opened Mm -hmm. this week. Their logo is having a stroke. But other than that. (laughs) It was so funny. I got the email and it says, we have a bold new logo. And I looked and it's like the same logo with a number dropped. And I was like, okay, that's what we're calling bold. You know what? you that isn't some... <laughs> the flex you think it is, Sundance. <laughs> what, but I don't get it. What's what's the the dropped four for? What is that? I looked everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> if I get an interview with the marketing person for Sundance, that is like the first question. Yo, talk to me about your bold new logo. <laughs> Did somebody just fall asleep <laughs> just on the on the down arrow? I was so confused. Like, I saw it and I was like, oh, a glitch. Let me go find the actual logo <laughs> that they're sending. <laughs> and I yeah. seriously scoured the site. There must be something bold here somewhere. <laughs> no, that's just it. <laughs> but yeah, seriously, Sunday is this ticketing system. I've only used it once. I think, what was that? What was the year Coda was out? 2021? 2021. Yep. Yeah. That was the only time I've been. And I, I actually paid my way that year. All other stuff has been accreditation requests have been rejected. That was the one year where I could be like, okay, I can pay the two fifty bucks, two hundred fifty dollars to do it virtually. And yeah, like even there were some more high profile films like Coda, Mm -hmm. where I didn't even get in on the first wave, and it was very easy Mm -hmm. to just get that. I forget what they call their reruns. Oh, their second screenings. Yeah, second yeah. screenings. Mm-hmm. It was very. Yeah, absolutely. Look, overall, TIFF is, I, I've made TIFF a priority festival every year. I, I think that now that we both did the virtual festival thing and we were always trying to be at as many festivals as we could, cover as many of them, see as many movies as we could. I'm not as young as I used to be a few years ago. <laughs> Even the virtual <laughs> festivals are starting to get to me and I'm only 27. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It These are tough. And so I think that I'm becoming a lot more discerning about what to give time and energy to. And so while I would love to go to, to South by Southwest with it happening just a couple months after Sundance, Sundance is my priority. I just, um, Sundance and TIFF have become my priority festivals. Um, in addition to the local ones, obviously SIF and VIF I, I, is very, are very easy for me to attend. Um, but uh, but for traveling and putting a lot of effort into, um, you, you gotta uh, be mindful about what is best for the outlet uh, that that I'm running, that you're running, um, and manage bandwidth appropriately. And that is still something that I'm trying to learn. So one of the steps that I'm doing is to figure out what's priority. And TIFF is definitely a priority festival. It's been very easy enough for me to get to the. The press team has been incredible to work with. And so I, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. To give my Mount Rushmore slam dance because mm-hmm. it's much easier to access and their press team is, oh <laughs> man, their press team. Oh, your mm-hmm. your beautiful press team. And they have a lot more films that are just so weird. Mm-hmm. They're like delightfully weird. Um. Oh, what was it? What was the, oh, I forget the name of it. Gosh, I did an interview about it but there's a jerry shoe movie there i can't remember the name of it though but that was very good downwind which i think Mm. is now out on digital i just Mm -hmm. randomly happened and just a bunch of stuff from there ends up in in my like middle of the year every year tribeca especially if you can go even if it's just for like the gala stuff Mm. some of the best 
documentaries from there now that AFI docs isn't a thing anymore. Like, mm -hmm. Break the Game was really good uh, at Tribeca this year. Maybe not good. It was like a great documentary, mm -hmm. if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Like, it didn't try to do too much. And then, if I can ever go again, AFI Fest would be the final, like, mm -hmm. cherry on top. Because I, I do want to go back to Sundance, but Mm -hmm. uh, slam dance and sundance being the same time yeah i have hot takes about slam dance because i would love to attend slam dance but i'm at sundance and i remember actually this last year when i was at sundance there was someone passing out like little cards of, uh, about a film that's playing at slam dance and i'm just like what do you want me to do with this i'm at sundance right now i, I do well, not have time to go to slam dance <laughs> and the funny thing is oh i would say in my interviews for during slam dance i'd be like and hey if you're at Slam Dance already, you can go right across the street to go watch the movies at Sundance mm -hmm. because it's literally like right across the street. Oh, no, it is. No, I seriously, I was walking through downtown Park City and there were people like promoting Slam Dance. And it's just, it's tough for me because I wanted to see the film, but I'm just like, I got three movies to watch today at Sundance and I just, I, I don't have the the time or space to fit in slam dance i really wish that slam dance i think slam dance has this will be my quick hot take and then and then mm -hmm. we can wrap up but i think slam dance has built enough credibility itself that it could move to the summer because do you know how much more i'd rather be in park city in the summer oh, man. <laughs> than in the winter sundance is already a very confusing thing for me like y'all put this festival in this remote city that is already dedicated to skiing and snowboarding during peak skiing and snowboarding season. I will never understand that decision, but that's what happened. And so for slam dance, I think piggybacking off of that was a good starter strategy. But I think that they've built enough credibility for themselves now that if they can just if they can just pick up a, a solid film, premiere it and move the festival to summer, I would actually really consider going to that because yeah. I would love to be in Park City in the summer. It's easier to get to. It's more, it's less crowded from skiers and snowboarders there's more lots of outdoor activities to still do which i'm sure park city capitalizes on and a slam dance it's it, i think it's going to be it could be a sundance one of these days 10 years yeah. down the road it just has to detach from sundance <laughs> yeah know? it really does because i i was literally offered i did one interview for a sundance movie mm -hmm. and i almost messed up the scheduling and said slam dance 2023 oh it was uh, Murder in Bighorn. Oh, um, yes, that's right. Yeah. And I figured out the name of the film. It's starring Jerry as himself. So that's very good. And they're very judicious on giving out screeners. So mm -hmm. maybe you can still, whenever it comes to VOD, you can get it. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. But with that said, I just want to give a quick outline of some stuff I've posted. I've posted a lot of inter discussion, film discussions this week. I talked with Ann Stuckey. Stuckey? I forget how to pronounce her name. Sorry, Ann. Uh, for El Conde, I talked with Sebastian Zavala with, for Elemental. I talked with Emmanuel for Cocaine Bear. I interviewed the director of Something You Said Last Night, which is now out in New York. I will be, uh, let's see, I'm interviewing the executive director for the Tallgrass Film Festival on Wednesday. And then re uh, recording the Barbie podcast discussion with Elise Shavens. Sorry, Elise, if I pronounced any of that wrong. <laughs> but then before we leave, I want to thank my patrons, Ambula Bula, Brian Scuttle, Joseph Davis of Sif Pop. He's like the managing editor, I think, at Sif Pop. Matthew Simpson of Awesome Friday. I think I've got plans to get him on, actually. And Tom Blackburn, who gave me this whole like critic to critic discussion thing idea. So if you want to become a patron, you can head on over to patreon.com slash awesomebmedia. Or I've made a custom link, austinb.media slash support. Or I think you can even use join.austinb.media. That's one of my custom links. And if you want to listen to these podcasts on Spotify via the Patreon feed, I believe you can connect your Patreon and Spotify accounts to listen to these discussions in audio form 24 hours before everyone else. With that, I thank everyone for listening to the Austin B Media podcast. I have been your host, Austin Belzer. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app wherever applicable i know some don't have ratings or reviews i know spotify has ratings and reviews but some others don't it's 
see. You can also follow me on social media at Austin B. Media everywhere except for Twitter slash X. <laughs> Let's see, Thomas, where can they find you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you can find For Real on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Most of the handles are at This Is For Real. I think Instagram, someone's hogging that one. So it's This Is For Real at uh, underscore IG. IG. Yeah, but you can also find all those links on my, on the website. Uh, this is for real.com. For real, of course, spelled F O R E E L. And you can also find me personally on social media, uh, Instagram and Twitter at being TSJ. We just have a bunch of TIFF content right now, <laughs> yeah. lots of reviews and, and, and media. And I will say, I forgot to mention this in our TIFF discussion, but you also had contributors contributing yeah. to the TIFF 2023 stuff. Um, yeah, that's another thing that I really would like to shout out really quick is my team is phenomenal. We have a number of writers and content creators who are who are doing great work on the website, whether it be with reviews, with interviews, with video reviews as well. We have one of our content creators is doing like bite-sized movie reviews. And so we're doing we, we have a really awesome team and, and I'm super thankful for them and, and the great work that they're doing. And it can all be found at this is for real.com. Yeah, thank you again, Thomas, for coming on. I maybe we'll have you on again next year for TIFF twenty twenty four. Yes, and I can give all the updates. I can, <laughs> or, or maybe Dick's the musical if it comes here. Hey, there's an idea. I can talk more about that movie. I need or I need... past lives. I, I don't know. There's a lot, tons of there's stuff. There's a lot. To there's <laughs> movies always coming out. So cool. I appreciate you having me on, Austin. This has been a great time as always. Same. You're always welcome. You're always welcome. <laughs>